This is Duke University. Jonathan Gendez is currently the Chief Financial Officer and Senior Vice President of Business Development at Affinergy. He and uh, Affinergy's two scientific co-inventors uh, began working together in 2002 to form Affinergy while Jonathan was actually still pursuing his MBA at Fuqua. Affinergy is a very interesting RTP-based biotech company that develops coatings and medical devices for orthopedic and cardiovascular uh, markets. And despite uh, Jonathan's non-biology background in economics and his several years of corporate strategy at Deutsche Bank, Jonathan somehow has successfully broke into biotech with a startup. And you may ask, well, how did he do that? Well, it's very relevant to our topic on teams tonight. Uh, Jonathan developed uh, Finergy's initial business strategy, negotiated the technology license from Duke University, and particularly important for us is, and for the discussion on, on teams, is he recruited a senior management team along with other scientific staff and business advisors. So I'd like to welcome Jonathan. Looking forward to it. I might do the talk just from I can reach over. I'll do the talk right from here since uh, is that okay for That's the totally fine. And you yeah, can bring the keyboard over if you want or something like that. So folks. Yeah, nice clicker. All set, right? Okay. Um, so when I finish, I'll let you guys critique me, and then this way it'll feel a little bit more level playing. <laughs> it's only appropriate. Um, so uh, I'm going to share some insights on how we have built our management team at Affinergy and what I've learned about it in general. Uh, certainly one perspective, and every company, uh, you build the management team differently. Um, you play different roles. Com IT companies have different needs than life science companies, so that really impacts the uh, experience level that you might recruit people. But I think some of the parallels across companies are usually you have very limited to zero resources when you start recruiting your team. And hopefully if you do a good job, you over time have more and more resources. So how you recruit people adapts over time. Um, you, uh, and you just need to learn how to be flexible with that. Just because you didn't recruit somebody in a certain way in your first year doesn't mean in your seventh year you do it differently. In year one, we could never help somebody relocate to the area because we had no money. Now that we're in a much more mature state, we have some flexibility when we find the right talent to be able to recruit them locally and help them relocate uh, with some, some, some funds. So uh, what's important is to just be flexible. Our, uh, aside for generally building the management team, are, the, are there a couple of high-level topics that, that you guys want to make sure that I cover? Are people trying to think about how they're going to staff their current management team? or? Just general interests, anyone willing to throw out one or two uh, thoughts that they're looking to hear on? I think it'd be great if you could go, go through your perspective from, since you have ground zero to, you know, 20 million in finance and plus, if you could walk through some of the chronology of what the stage looked like you know, in ground zero and what the stage looked like sequentially up until where you are now and what you're forecasting forward to, uh, how your management uh, needs are going to change over time, okay. and how you can look into the future in the crystal ball. Okay. Talk as well. Okay. And I was going to say about maybe you can cover uh, topics about providing the right incentives for your management team to commit to the long run. Okay. Or uh, how do you do that? You start out with no money. Okay. So just incentive structures and compensation, things like that. Okay, that's the most important one. Uh, definitely hit on that one. Good, good point. Okay, definitely can do that. Okay, so um, first you can you 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 might want to know why is building the team important. Um, so building the team is important because investors and uh, it's the single most important part of your business, your management team. 
I think if you asked any investor, would they take an A management team and a B level product over over an A level product and a B level management team? They wouldn't think twice about it. They'd probably take an A level management team with a C level product <laughs> or a D level product because what usually happens in most businesses is things don't go as you expect. That's one of the few certainties um, that occurs. And a savvy management team that can stay flexible is what navigates through a crooked path. Because uh, things are always different. They need some imp imp improvisation. Uh, you need more money. It takes longer. You made a mistake hiring the wrong person, et cetera. So what you really do is need, you need people that are flexible and that are really savvy, and hopefully that bring experience to the table in, the, in small environments. So there's, there's a not, you can't really say enough about the importance of building the management team in a young company. Um, the team, when you're getting started, is also a proxy for um, the caliber of the idea. So it's hard for everybody to always understand the idea you have, but people are a proxy for your, for your idea. So when you meet people in the community, whether you're raising money or whatnot or growing your business, um, everybody can't exactly understand every last detail of your business model. But what they can do is they, they know known commodities in your industry. So if uh, you, know, you are building a certain medical device and you have a Nobel laureate who's joined your team who has expertise on that topic, so someone who comes along no longer feels the need to do the same level of diligence because they know the Nobel laureate hasn't joined your team in some fashion without doing diligence of their own. So it's kind of a growth by association. Now, that, now you need to be careful on the contrary. If you begin to associate yourself with people that have a, a negative reputation in the community or have uh, you know, had some challenges in how people have dealt with them, it'll work the same way in reverse. So um, that's a pretty important concept. And as we talk about building the team, it's not just the people you hire as your full-time employees. It's uh, people that are helping you as consultants. It's people that are helping you as board members. It's people in your community that might be your attorneys, your accountants, really anyone who has some level of involvement with the company. Um, so I want you to think about the team really broadly because early on you need, um, you need everybody's help because you don't have a lot of employees. You have one, two, three employees, but you might have 10 or 15 advisors, uh, consultants, board members, uh, service providers. So that's important to think about it that way. Um, So early on, what, what, what I think everyone should think about, and I know what I thought about personally, is what role, as you get your company started, what role would you like to play on that team? A, what role would you like to play? And B, role, what role are you qualified to play? Hopefully those questions yield the same answer, but they don't always. Um, in my, using my experience as an example, um, when we were getting the company started, I had met the inventors taking a class at, uh, in the business school. And uh, I had no scientific background. I had done a lot of operational roles and strategic roles, and I knew finance pretty well from my previous experience. Um, but I had never really been involved raising capital or being in a high growth entrepreneurial environment. So it was pretty clear to me we would need to raise capital, and capital raising was a pretty local activity. So the next thing was I was, I'm from, from New Jersey, if you can't pick up my accent. I don't have a southern accent. and I would, in effect, be a transplant here, which there's nothing wrong with, but I don't know everyone in the community here for 15, 20 years, whereas I might know them in my home market for, for, for a lot longer. So as I sensed that, I, I figured I needed someone who uh, had good knowledge of the community locally where we were going to base the business. Um, I needed uh, somebody who could help raise capital. And most importantly, I needed someone who could serve as a mentor for me because for, I wanted to be in an environment where I was learning. So in effect, I decided I needed to hire a CEO to join the company and uh, spend a good bit of time working lots of different channels to find somebody who might be a fit for that. I, I kind of wrote down the responsibilities I thought that person needed to fill. Um, I wrote down the experience I was looking for and I started networking and meeting people. Um, never bothered me that I wasn't going to be the CEO. I never really cared about the title. I really wanted someone I could learn from and then I was fortunate to find um, a CEO really early on that, that worked really well with me was a good fit and met the criteria that I was looking for. Um, doesn't mean that, that everyone in this room can't be the CEO of their startup. There's nothing wrong with that. If, uh, 
if you have the background and the experience and you want to go at it, you certainly can. I think in an IT business, it's a lot easier um, as someone early in their career to, to take on that role because maybe your capital needs are lower. I think the higher the, need, the capital needs are for the business, um, especially in a life science community, you need a lot more experience. Um, it, sometimes experience in an IT-based business may actually work against you, so they work really differently, and I, I can't speak as much to the IT side. Um, Tony, right? Your name, Tony? Yeah. So Tony asked a really great point about trust, and I think trust is one of the most important points when you're getting started to build your team. Um, you want to make sure the people that you are hiring on your team, especially your, the early hires that are kind of co-founders or key, key stakeholders, you want to make sure you can trust those people there. There are so many things that can go wrong in the building of your business, and the one thing that's not acceptable to go wrong is for, for, for people to start screwing each other or for you not to believe uh, heavily that someone's got your back in a tough situation, that someone's not going to sell you out because they can make 5% more money, um, that when it gets rocky, you're going to take care of people appropriately. That's one of the single most important factors that I was looking for when I hired uh, our CEO. And the person I hired had a really high integrity level, and I was able to ascertain that from checking a lot of references. I think that's absolutely paramount at an early stage for the key members of your team that you feel like you trust them. Because too often things can fall apart. Um, when, when the situation's rocky, um, you need to stick together if you're going to get through it. If you're going to start fighting, squabbling, um, someone's going to jump ship to get a different job, you need to really figure that out. Along those lines, I think it's helpful for the people on the early team to have uh, similar expectations or at least discuss your expectations for the first few years, how you're going to fund the company. Um, if you have three people on the founding team, is everybody willing to work for no pay for six months? Is, you know, if one person can't do that and two people can, just have that conversation early on. Don't, don't delay that conversation. Um, if one person has a mortgage and two people don't, sit down and talk about what this is going to mean. Are you expecting the person with the house to collateralize his house for the whole business? That's not maybe fair. It's something you want to sit down and discuss. I think you just want to have an open communication between the founders around your expectations when there's no money. Um, and if you can learn how to get along when there's no money, it's a lot easier to get along when, when the money comes along because uh, you already trust each other and you know you take care of each other fairly. Um, you're going to know the salaries of each other. You may set the salaries of each other at some point. Uh, so these are important conversations to have. And if you can't have this conversation with, a, I'm thinking, like a partner of your company early on, they're not the right partner probably. Um, as you start hiring more people in the company um, at different levels, these issues are still important, but they're, they're uh, how important they are, I think, continues to decrease over time. It's not that everybody in the company needs to be the, the most trustworthy best friend that you have in the world. Your founder and your partner needs to be that. You need to certainly trust other members of the company, but, but the level of importance, I think, slowly diminishes. Um, another really good point I want to highlight here is the, the goals of the management team, just like the management team should have similar goals, you should try to align those goals with the investors that you bring on board. So whoever your source of capital is, have an open conversation with your source of capital so, so he or she or, or, or they have similar expectations to when they're going to get their money back, how they're going to get their money back, what happens if they don't get their money back. Okay? These are very important conversations to have. If they're your relatives and you, go, and you don't give them their money back, can you still come to Christmas? Can you still come to Thanksgiving or are they going to drive you nuts? Um, if it's an investor, do they expect their money back in four years when you're trying to build a 10-year business? Um, I think the, the, the consistent theme here is to just have open communication with the early stakeholders in your business, investors, advisors, consultants, partners, whatever it is. Make sure you communicate it. And if you have different expectations than people, discuss it early. Don't sit on it and then later find out somebody expected to be getting a dividend in year three because they gave you some money and you have no money to pay them. Okay. Um, let's see what else can I share on this. Um, you put in place, uh, in terms of uh, kind of compensation and incentive structures, um, anytime you bring other people into your team, usually in a startup business, at least early on, everybody's getting equity in the company. Um, you get different levels. You can, even people on your board are getting equity in the company, and usually that equity 
is uh, vested over four years, and what that means is you may make somebody a grant of equity, and they earn a little bit every month that they work. Traditionally, um, equity grants are given over four years. Um, in many startup companies, the way they're structured is they have what's called a cliff um, for one year. And what a cliff is, um, your equity does invest until the cliff ends. So if you have a, if you have a four year vesting schedule on equity and a one year cliff, at the end of the first year, you earn 25% of the equity you were granted because it's one over four. If you left in month 10, you get no equity. If you got fired in month 10, you get no equity. And the purpose of the cliff is really important because sometimes you make mistakes, sometimes somebody joins, uh, it's not a good fit, and the cliff's a way to protect the company from giving out stock to everyone who comes on board. Not protect from bad decisions. It's not that you're not gonna get the stock if you're there and you earn it, but it protects the company from a bad decision here and there, or if somebody's a good decision, but they leave. Um, so that's really important to structure. Um, won't go into all the details, but the way you grant stock to early individuals is extremely important for tax purposes. So as you start thinking about how you're going to grant stock to different people, um, talking with your accountant is, is very important. There's ways to grant um, restricted stock, which has one set of tax implications, where you pay for the stock now and you have different tax treatment later. There's a way to grant different stock options. Certain people get one type of stock options, other people get different types of stock options. Um, each one has some slightly different uh, pros and cons from the tax perspective. So uh, it's worth having a short conversation uh, with your accountant early on as you are granting large shares, because these are things that can get tricky to fix later. Um, best thing, okay. Just yeah. uh, when you start up your company, how you learn this kind of uh, techniques, how, how you uh, grant the stock options to your team members, and how you, how, how you learn something like a cliff or sure. kind of thing? Um, so anytime you make a decision in a, I would suggest anytime you make a decision in a small business, that decision is made after you have talked to several people who have already made that decision, right? Doesn't matter what the decision is. So if I'm starting a small business like I was, I surrounded myself early on first with our CEO who had done this before and had been involved with it. So immediately he knew the obvious things. Um, shortly thereafter, we had a couple of advisors that turned into board members. They had seen this hundreds of times. So if you need to structure a compensation arrangement, you want to make sure you have a couple people that are helping you think about how to structure an arrangement. It might be something as easy as a cliff or a vesting schedule. I've seen people that are starting businesses and they say, hey, this guy's going to be my partner. I'm going to give him 10% of the company. Well, they grant somebody 10% of the company fully vested on day one which is a horrible idea. But the person didn't realize, I can give the guy 10%, but I can vest the 10% over four years to make sure he has to earn it, he or she has to earn it. Um, I think any decision you have, you just want to talk to people who have made that decision before and talk to like three people. And when you start hearing the same thing a few times, you know you got probably the right answer. Is that helpful? Um, Okay, um, recruiting. So the next point, while you're all practicing your elevator pitches, um, okay. while you're all practicing your elevator pitches, what you really do is learning how to communicate and sell yourself. Okay, your elevator pitch is not just to raise money. I would argue one of the most important components of your elevator pitch is to recruit staff. Okay, the reason you will get an investor's money is because you build a great team. So if if you can use your elevator pitch and your communication skills to attract people to want to be with you and work with you, that's a really excellent outcome. People like to work with people that excite them, right? If someone stands up here and gives a really boring um, elevator pitch for, for two minutes, no one's jumping out of their seats to go and help them. But if someone gets up in front of the room and energizes the room with a great idea, it's realistic, it's communicated well. Suddenly people are interested in helping them and want to learn more. And that's no different whether you're hiring people um, you're recruiting folks to be on your board, or you're recruiting consultants. People want to be around a winner. So you need to convey the confidence that, that, that you're, you are building a winner. Not that you've won yet, but that you're building a winner and you're going to work really hard at it. And that's a nice way to get people excited early on. When you start, you usually start with uh, recruiting locally because you can't move people easily 
or if you could move somebody and you have no money, nobody likes to move when there's no pay to offer them. So usually you might start with people helping you that are in school, they're your classmates, um, maybe they're people looking to do something different from their current job and they're going to moonlight with you on the evenings and weekends. Um, as your business grows, you might use headhunters to recruit staff that are currently in jobs. You might use different techniques. Uh, but early on, uh, you usually will do most of your recruiting locally. Um, you, I found the best way to recruit is just to network, talk to a lot of people. Uh, I like to keep a list of people I've met along the way that I found impressive. So then when I want to hire somebody, I go look back at the list. It's not that I'm going to hire the person the day I meet them, but if I'm meeting with a company and there's someone at that company really impressive, a year or two later, I might want to hire that person, or I may want to call that person to get their opinion on some referrals. So even if you can't hire the person you were impressed with, impressive people usually give good referrals. So I might reach back to somebody who impressed them a lot. Um, I think in a, in a small company, uh, more so than a large company, communication is really important and transparency is really important. Um, people are going to live and die with the viability of the company early on, especially at early stages when you don't have a lot of money. You may only have money that your, your payroll may not be refilling as quick as you want. Early on you may have to ask somebody to work for a lot less money than they expect. Uh, some companies will struggle and miss payrolls here and there. So the best way to handle those issues um, is to have really good communication with the people that you bring on board. They need to feel like you're not going to hide things from them for better or worse. Uh, when times are tough, you're going to share information with them. When times are going well, you're going to share information. If they ask you a question, you're going to give them an honest answer. That's extremely important um, as you're really small and growing the company. When you're, as you get larger, it's not that those things aren't important, but again, the level of detail you might share when you have 100 employees might be different than the level of detail when you have 8 employees. At 8 employees, we were pretty accurately telling people how much cash was in the bank, every last bit of detail. They'd know how a meeting went with a client and a big deal that we were close to signing. So they were on the roller coaster with us. Because at, when you have eight employees, those employees are people who like to be on the roller coaster and aren't going to get sick. Okay? There's ups and downs in the roller coaster ride. You just can't get too excited when you're at the top or at the bottom. Now, when you have 100 or 200 or 300 employees, the person who's employee number 300 isn't necessarily someone who likes to be on a roller coaster. So if you take them on a roller coaster ride, they're going to get sick and they're going to leave. So sometimes you need to adjust. It's not that you're not going to be transparent with them. They don't need to know every, every fork in the road because those things just drive that employee usually nuts. If they wanted to know every fork in the road, they'd be employee 8, not employee 300. There's a different interest that that person has. So you adapt your style over time. I think that's what's important. <coughs> um, Equally important to hiring the right people is when, when, when you sense that you have not hired the right person, uh, addressing it quickly is really important. Okay, so who in this room has ever fired somebody? Raise your hand if you fired somebody. Okay. Usually, especially when you're early in your career, if you're starting a business, you've never fired anybody. It's a really difficult thing to do. It's probably the worst thing you ever have to do and it's extremely uncomfortable. I know the handful of times I've had to do it. I absolutely hated it. I dreaded it. I knew we needed to let somebody go long before we ever took action because when you, people don't like to do things that they don't enjoy. Um, when you make a mistake in hiring, you need to address it quickly. It's one of the most important things you can do for your business. You need to do it for your business. You need to do it for the person that, that isn't a fit because that person needs the opportunity to move on to a new role. Not for you to get angry at them for two years because you waited, to, waited too long to fire them. You need to sit down with that person and, and let them go and let them find another responsibility. doesn't mean they're a bad person. They just might not be a fit for your role. You needed to hire a certain set of skills and they're not the right set of skills. You needed you know, someone who'd come to work at 6 in the morning and they can't get to work before 10 in the morning. Maybe, you know, maybe they weren't working hard enough, but often it's just not the right seat for them. It's really difficult, so make sure someone on your team is always being sensitive to that issue. And usually someone on your team should have fired people before. Because if there's no one on the team who's ever fired anybody, that's a sign that the team isn't experienced enough. Or you're too soft. Um, not that you fired somebody just because you want to be difficult, but People, if you're an experienced manager, it's almost impossible that you haven't fired someone if you're doing your job right. It's just the law of numbers. Um, 
So someone around the table who can kind of help nudge you when you need to, I think is pretty important. And I'm not suggesting like hiring because you don't have enough, you're running out of money. Firing because you're running out of money. I'm talking about firing because of poor performance. Um, very important, really hard to deal with. Doesn't get any easier to deal with the more you do it. So it's never going to feel good. It's still something you need to take care of. Because when you, and this has happened to us uh, personally, when you make a hiring mistake, any mistake you make when you're small compounds, okay? So when you have five people and you make a hiring mistake, and then later you're 25 people, if you haven't fixed that hiring mistake, that person has influenced your organization for several years. Maybe they've hired three more people into your organization. So let's just say that person had a, a suboptimal work ethic. I bet you when they interviewed the next three people they hired, there's a good chance the next three people they hired didn't necessarily have the work ethic you were looking for, but rather had the work ethic consistent with that individual, or, or whatever the hiccup might have been. You're just going to really accentuate that problem by the length. So that's, that's really important. Um, next point, I think the third point I have here is just to set the tone. And this is just about uh, my philosophy on leadership. When you're, when you're starting a business, it's your role as the leader to really set the tone for the company. If you are expecting everybody to really work hard to get meet a deadline, well, you need to meet, work hard to meet a deadline. That should be obvious, but just because you're the boss and you've hired other people doesn't mean you get to leave early um, while everyone else tries to hit the deadline. That's not how you grow a business. That's not how you build faith in people. Um, you should be willing to do every task you're asking others to do. And I think it's helpful in building your team when you take on the most uh, menial activities and just tackle them and, and, and show it doesn't bother you one bit. Show you're willing to do any activity, it doesn't matter what it is, and don't ask someone else to do something that you're not willing to do. That's probably obvious, but I think that's really important the longer you can stick with that over time. Now when the company gets bigger and there are 50 people, you may not always be able to kind of do every activity, and that's not going to make sense for you to do every activity. But showing that you're willing to is really important, and that's a good way to build your corporate culture. Don't just give the garbage activities to somebody else, especially when you're small early on. Um, jump in if you guys have questions as I go through this. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about the board and advisors, because having people that have done this before in your industry are really important. Um, I, we could not have been successful to this stage growing our business had we not recruited consultants, uh, management, and board members that had seen this happen before. Uh, whatever industry you're in, there's, there's not a substitute for experience. Uh, someone who's done something before is going to be so helpful in helping you make a smart decision. They're not going to make the decision for you, but they're going to tell you what to watch out for, who else to go get advice from, um, what mistake they made in the past what things they did well in the past, et cetera. Um, having an independent board is really important. This gets overlooked for people that don't raise capital. Um, too often when you don't raise capital, you're not forced to create a board of directors, or you're not forced especially to make an independent board of directors. Let's say you start a company, it's brilliant, you own 80% of the company and you let 20% of the company owned by your staff. You don't have a single investor because you started the company from scratch, right? maybe more likely to happen on the IT side than it is on the life science side. But I would urge you to set up some type of advisory board that you use to keep you accountable. I know our board, we meet every, we started meeting more frequently when the company was young, but we now meet every two months. And I know I tell the board certain deadlines that we're going to hit. And I work hard to hit those deadlines. And I like that extra pressure that the board keeps me accountable. They know I gave them these slides in January that said I'm going to hit this by the end of the second quarter, and I work really hard at it. It's not that I wouldn't work hard at it anyway, but someone to keep me accountable is really important. Um, so the, the accountability you get from board members is very valuable. The connections you get from board members, they may help you recruit staff. Um, they may help you raise money. Extremely, extremely important. Um, by the certain people associating with your company, um, that helps all these other factors are all related. If you're trying to close a business deal, a board member may help you with a phone call to get that business deal closed. A board member may have worked at the company before you're trying to close a deal with. Um, so you'd be surprised that maybe someone you're negotiating with used to work with the board member that you have. Right? You'd be really surprised um, how helpful people can be. Now you don't want all the board members to have the same expertise. 
you want to make sure that they generally understand your industry. Uh, you want to make sure the different areas that are important to building your business are represented on the board. So if your business is extremely important to um, develop the best code in the world, maybe one of your board members should have a really deep technical expertise in the area that you're thinking about. If the next important step for your business is to sell every last dollar of advertising space, maybe someone on the board should have sold advertising in, the, in a web-based model previously, or at least have some high-level understanding on how to do it. And if it's going to be really important to raise $50 million of capital, maybe it'd be nice if one of the board members has been associated with companies that have raised capital before and can assist you in the steps you need to raise capital. So you don't need the same expertise in each person. If you do a good job, um, bring those people to the table. You'll give them equity in your company because they're going to contribute and help grow your company. And they'll take it seriously and they'll meet with you and help mentor you. And you can decide if you meet with them individually or you meet with them as a group, whatever form makes most sense for your stage. Um, but getting insight in that type of fashion is really important. Um, yeah? What's the typical share of equity that you give to your board or to your advisors? Um, so it's going to vary a lot by stage of development. Uh, it might range, I've seen in surveys, anywhere from uh, a tenth of a percent to one or two percent. Depends on your expectations of how much time they commit. Somewhere in that range, depending upon stage, how much time, etc. cetera. Uh, how do you find these uh, board members? Uh, by yourself or by some investors? Or what kind of sources? Um, you find hey, John, them. Do you mind repeating that question for sure. people? In the so back? the question was, how do you find the board members to help you out? Um, you find them. You find them through a lot of networking. You don't go. You know. You don't on day one find the right individual. They're usually people who have mentored you for a little while that you may feel add good expertise to the company. Um, someone on your team who knows the industry. Uh, so if you're building um, a web-based startup. Okay? Lots of web-based startups are local in RTP. If you get involved in the community, you'll find 30 of 30 web-based startups that have been successful in the last five years. Maybe you can meet some of those executives that have been in the successful companies, and they'll be willing to mentor you. Maybe after, maybe after they mentor you for six months, they like you, they see you listening to them, you invite them to join your board. So that might be how you meet somebody. Depends on the type of expertise you're looking for. Um, if you have investors that are putting money in your company, they'll usually help find the board members. They'll usually sit on the board themselves, but they'll usually help you fill the board slots for independent board members. And an independent board member, what I mean by that, it means you're not, they're not part of the management, they're not an investor, meaning um, they're bringing independent thought to the table. They're not making a decision because they own a big piece in your company. They're trying to represent everybody's interest. So uh, one, other, one last point on this, um, most people think of board meetings that you know you get together as a group, you might meet quarterly, public companies all have boards, you can go look at them, they meet quarterly usually or every six months. When you're small you need to meet more frequently and what's really important is feel free to, you need to reach out to these people one on one, meet them for lunch, meet them for coffee, meet them in between meetings. So I know on our board each person has a special expertise and we'll usually meet them several times in between meetings because we want to talk about their specific topic and we don't want to wait to the board meeting. We want to get a little bit more into the details because board meetings usually aren't for getting in the weeds. Uh, but if we want to get in the weeds on a problem and someone has an expertise, we'll just meet them um, in, in between meetings. And if someone's willing to be on your board, it means they're willing to commit time to help you. Or if someone's willing to be an advisor, they're going to commit time to help you. Exactly what you call them, I don't think, uh, matters. Um, and just take advantage and show you listen and write, take notes when they talk to you. It doesn't mean you have to listen to everything they say. Make sure you have a good reason if, if you don't agree with something. There's nothing wrong with not agreeing. Um, make sure you get multiple opinions before you make an important decision. Jonathan, you got a question in the middle yeah. here. Oh, on an average, like for average startup, how many people are on a board, like generally? How many people do you have? Um, you usually would start pretty small, like uh, three to five people. Right. Um, you know, so if you were, you might early on have three people. One might be the founder of the company or the CEO. 
Um, maybe one would be an investor and one would be kind of a, uh, into someone with industry knowledge. You could have five. You probably early on don't want to have more than, more than five. Um, as you get later and you have more money raised, that's when you might have five, seven, nine people. Usually what happens is the people who keep putting more money into the company want a seat on the board, so you keep expanding the size of the board. Uh, it gets tricky to manage as, you, as the board gets bigger over time. So our specific board, uh, we meet, um, I said every other month, we have six people on the board. Usually you have an odd number because you, you know everyone thinks, oh, the board meeting, we're going to have a vote. Uh, I've been at every board meeting for six years. I've never seen us raise our hands and really have a vote. Uh, I mean, we, we agree on like granting stock options and no one ever dissents. We just discuss an issue and if it, people aren't in agreement, we usually don't move forward or somebody knows to yield because someone else knows more. So. Um, Usually you have an odd number, but we just have six because that's how it worked out. Um, what's important, I think, and a mistake people can make when, so the people you should invite as board members and advisors, by definition, these are people that are smarter and more experienced than you, right? There's no need to hire someone who's less experienced and less intelligent than you to help advise you. It makes no sense. So when you meet someone who's more intelligent and more experienced, what should you do? You should keep quiet, okay? You ask a couple of questions, and then you keep quiet, and you get feedback from those people. It sounds obvious, but too often, people come, they think they have the best idea in the world, and they've asked you for your help, and they talk 90% of the time. That's not how you get help from somebody. For board or no board, if you're asking someone for their advice, tee up the advice you're looking for, clarify when they need help clarifying, and be quiet and listen to their advice. And that's extra important as you formalize your board meetings and as you get people that are more and more experienced over time. Because someone who's experienced and who values their time, if you don't listen to them, they'll stop giving you their time. They won't tell you, shut up, but they'll just stop giving you their time and they, they'll say, look, I can't do this anymore. I need to be on my kid's soccer team, right? They're not going to tell you exactly that you talk too much. So really, really be careful when you're meeting with people or getting advice from people that you know how to stop and listen. Very important. Um, so the other people that, that kind of less specific than board members that you want to recruit to your team are networks of advisors. And I have at the bottom listed um, a dozen or so uh, people that can help from different areas. These people might be your attorneys. Early on, your attorneys could help introduce you to a key person. I met our CEO through our attorney. Our attorney knew the CEO was looking for a job. This individual is looking for something. I told our attorney, hey, I need to find somebody with more experience. Please keep your ears open if you know any executives locally that might meet these criteria. Met him through the attorney. Now, I told that message to like 10 different people that I was working with, and one of them panned out. Other people passed along referrals that weren't a fit, but everyone was trying to be helpful. Um, other people on this list, uh, these are very life science specific, but you have your accounting firm, they're helping you with all different types of complex accounting issues that you, that you may encounter early on. Your, uh, your attorney and your patent attorney is helping you with all your patent issues. At some point in time, they may refer you to someone important. They're going to play a really key role in how your intellectual property develops. So picking the right people in these areas is key. So again, the next question is, how do I know who to pick? Well, if someone on your team is experienced and they've picked before, they know how to pick, right? If you've never picked before, you immediately should stop and not pick. It's not, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you should never do anything that's foreign, but if you reach an important decision and you've never encountered that before, pause and get some feedback from other people. That's what's important. And in any of these areas, if you ask enough people, you can find experts in these spaces. Um, now, an expert that I think for a patent attorney might be very different than an expert patent attorney in an IT space. So if you're building an IT business, don't come ask me who, what patent attorney you should work with because I don't have any idea what patent attorney you should work with because I don't know who's good at writing IT patents. I know the space that I've worked in reasonably broad. So ask somebody in the space, someone who's been in the space that you're working in. Um, okay, so here's here hit a, many of these points, but. How do you get people to help you when, when you can't really pay them much, right? 
So what are you going to do to gain this momentum? Because when you're small, the trick is to gain momentum. First you gain a little bit, then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So first you might get, you know, they may put something in the local Duke newspaper about your company, right? Then later you may get honored by the CED. Then later you might get your first round of capital. Each of these events keeps feeding off the next. You don't always appreciate it, but maybe the reason you got your first round of capital is because your name's been mentioned several. It's not why you got the capital, but your name getting mentioned and being known is going to be helpful to you raising the capital. Later on, your ability to hire in an executive from out of town is going to be enhanced if that executive has heard the name of your company uh, because you've published a lot of papers or because they know about your website. So little steps really help you build momentum later. Um, let's see, a couple of these, I already hit on listen a lot. I think demonstrating that you act on advice is important. So if you meet with somebody, they share you a lot of advice. I'm not suggesting you have to do everything, but if there are a couple of good nuggets in there, make sure when you meet with them a second time, you acted on a few of those steps. So if someone suggested, hey, you should look into A, B, and C, right? And you go to meet that person two months later, and you haven't looked into A, B, and C, and they catch that, they're going to not want to help you anymore. Or if you looked into A, B, and C and it didn't make sense, that's not a problem. You don't have to do it just because they suggested it. But make sure you invested a little time afterwards to hunt down um, the areas that they suggested. So at least you know, hey, this was a good suggestion, it wasn't a good suggestion. Tell them, hey, your suggestion of A, B, and C was great. Um, it really helped me do this. Where can you point me in the next direction? Show people you value their time. I think early on when you're meeting folks, cut all your meetings off short. Don't sit with somebody for 90 minutes if they're a busy person. Ask them to meet with them for 15 or 30 minutes and kind of be really responsive and let them give you the cues if they're willing to give you more time. There's nothing wrong with that getting 30 minutes of someone's time. And don't stay longer than 30 minutes if you unless you get the cues from that person that they want to invest more time with you. This is especially true if you're going to meet with a physician. In the life sciences, you might go meet with physicians to get their opinions. You might want to meet like 15 or 20 minutes and cut it off once you've hit the right point. Don't waste that person's time because they won't give it to you again if you waste their time. Um, make sure you're responsive to the community. I think this is extremely important. And help other people. Don't, don't put your head in the ground and just be selfish. Um, you certainly want to build your own business, but make sure you spend time helping other people in the community because you'd be surprised when that help will come back for you. The overall community being strong is important for everybody. When you want to recruit people to the area down the road as you grow your business, our, our, the strength of our local community will be really important to recruiting talent. When somebody looks to move for, for my particular company, they want to know in two years if it doesn't work out that they can find another job here. That's one of their biggest concerns when somebody moves to the area. Will I be able to find another job? Okay? So if, if your company succeeds beyond belief, but it's the only one in the area that ever has success, that's not good for you. Many people in the area need success. If many companies have success, more investors will come to the area. It will breed a stronger management team, and it's helpful for all. So make sure you give back, whether it's volunteering at an event that Duke is hosting, whether it's participating in the startup challenge, helping someone, giving them good constructive criticism. Just whatever way you can do to help out, I think it's important. I think you want to be as humble as you can when you're starting. It's especially important when you meet with more experienced individuals. But again, who likes to help people that are know-it-alls? Few of us like to help people that are know-it-alls. Um, it's nothing wrong with being an expert in something, but just know, how, know what you don't know and ask for help on those topics. And I think that's really important to getting people to want to work with you. Okay, I'll try to wrap up not too much longer, maybe ten more, five or ten more minutes. Um, how do you network? I think this is a, a skill you don't usually get taught in school, whether it's undergrad or graduate school. Nobody really teaches you how to sell. Nobody teaches you how to meet people. But it's very important over time to build uh, relationships in the industry that you want to grow your business. And the way you do that, first way is to do it locally. So know everyone in your area on the campus here, right? If you have a certain focus area, try to know everyone who, who's thinking about that area on this campus. Then expand your reach and try to learn everyone in the community at, at NC State, at Chapel Hill. Try to get to know the people that are in your thought area, um, maybe local startups that are in your thought area. Um, 
go to CED events. If you're starting an IT company, make sure you go to the annual IT conference that CED is hosting. Um, if you're in life sciences, try to go to the North Carolina biotech events. Go and meet people that are in the community. Be friendly to people. Help them out when you can, because the best way to get somebody to help you is for you to have helped them first. Don't go around to a meeting looking for people to help you. That's not how you do it. You go to a meeting and you find people that you can help. Okay? So first you pay into the system, and then later when you need something back from the system, that's how the system will help you. But if you go around to a meeting only trying to get people to help you, that's not how you network. People smell that too quickly. Um, if you can afford it, try to go to conferences in your industry. Everybody's industry is going to have a handful of major conferences a year. Um, you usually will learn a lot. You can talk to people. Every time, go to every session you go listen to, sit in a different seat, make friends with your neighbor, learn about your neighbor's background, uh, get your neighbor's business card, follow up with the person afterwards. For some people, these are uncomfortable things to do, but it's important that someone on your team early on is doing these activities. So if you hate doing these activities, realize you hate them, and go find somebody who likes them, and get them on your team. And you can do all the technical details if you hate the social details, and make sure someone socially focusing on meeting people and kind of getting known in the community. Okay. So early on, I'm going to show you a couple work charts and then wrap up. Uh, early on, so what, what's your team look like, right? So there, I, it was me on the left, and we had two academic founders. So in our particular company, they developed a the concept. They met me, so there are three of us when we started the company. Later on, about 18 months later, um, a lot of hard work, probably not that much money has been invested in the company. We have quickly grown um, a board of directors. We have uh, four board members up here. Uh, we hired a CEO of the company. We had kind of myself and our head of R&D. And very quickly, we had uh, six staff. So we have uh, I don't know, nine people here about 18 months after the concept started. Um, many of these people came on board before we had money to pay them. Um, we found different ways to give them equity, um, defer their compensation. We found a way to get them help. But what's important is these people on the left are only half the team. They're the full-time team. Okay? These are the co-founders of the company. They're, they still stay involved early on. They're working a day a week. They're professors at universities. They're spending a lot of time. They're traveling to meetings with us. They're going to conferences. They're publishing papers. Okay? Down here at the bottom, we have our law firm, our patent firm, and our accounting firm. They're helping us network. They're helping us tackle some, some easy things. Um, in particular, these two firms um, did perform services up for us long before we could pay them. Each firm ran up about $50,000 in receivables before we could pay them. So they believed enough in, enough in us to be willing to run up $50,000 in bills. Now, not self-serving, but they didn't believe in us because I gave them a bad elevator pitch. Okay? Part of why they believed in us is because they could feel the energy that was with the company when it was getting started. So each of you should figure out how to convey that energy you have around your business because you need people to take a little leap early on. The way to get them to take that leap, like I mentioned earlier, is for you to be a, a person that people want to be around, for your business to convey that. And then here in the middle are, are people across a handful of different categories where we might think we were going to grow our business. So early on, we weren't really focused in terms of what product we would build. So we found people in a handful of different areas. Um, orthopedics was one key focus area. Um, we had infections, and this was another area. We recruited a senior person. Diagnostics we thought we might go into. Filtration we, we thought we might go into. So the way we explored these different businesses were to recruit senior people who would help out in exchange for equity to point us in the right direction. And it's not that everybody would answer every last question. But if we had a question in this general area, we'd go and talk to this guy. He'd usually be able to refer us to three more people we could talk to who knew the space. So that's how you want to use your advisors. Um, we actually have more people now. I just couldn't fit them on the slide. So everybody on the slide now are full-time employees, if I fast forward about five or six years. And we've grown over time to have, uh, I don't know, 24, 25 advisors. We have about 25 staff. And you can see over time, we have different reporting lines. And you know maybe most important, so I'm employee one, right? Two people in the company work for me. And we're, we're uh, overhead. We don't do what makes the company work. We support the company. We're not generally that important to the company's growth. I mean, uh, 
it's nice that we do a good job and uh, you know the, the folks that work for me play a really important role in keeping the trains run on time but everybody else important in the company works for this other person that we recruited to the company it's nothing wrong with that I, could, I don't care one bit everybody important in the company doesn't need to work for me that's not how you grow a business um, you adjust over time who works for whom right uh, you do your best you can to recruit in smart people and you just keep adding to your team and you don't get fixed that oh man I need 30 people working for me that's of absolutely no importance to me um, I care a lot that the stock that I have in the company gets more valuable and usually the way it gets more valuable is by me not choking control around everything yeah I just wondering if you could <clears throat> explain the uh, relationship with your CEO because you brought him in as, a, as one of the founders so do you now report to him technically I report to him I hired him so it's weird right I mean I hired him I made him an offer with how much we were going to pay him. Um, I told him how much equity he was going to get. Uh, we structured it early on when we hired him that he would, him and I would be partners in the company. So we tried to deal things on a very fair level. Technically, I report to him. We make decisions together as peers because of how long we've worked together. Um, what if there's a conflict? I, so if there was a conflict, I, I yield to him in a tie when he feels strongly because I know he has more experience than I do. Um, if I really felt he was wrong, I probably would yield to him and we would get our board members involved. For any important decision, we'd get our board members involved. And usually we'd both yield to what they said. Because they're usually right but long before we know it. Uh, if, the, you know, if, if I had been hired a year ago, the reporting relationship would look a lot different than if we started the company together. Like, we have shared hotel rooms with blood on the floor when we couldn't afford like we, we stay at this one really garbage hotel room in boston <laughs> once there's no money in the bank we have to make a trip to boston like i pay like 40 dollars a night on expedia him and i are sleeping in this hotel room like the sheets are dirty we spy the blood in the corner of the room it's disgusting right so like now now we don't have to stay at that level hotel room anymore but there's a certain bond that we can appreciate because like we went to mcdonald's for dinner because there was no money like we each had to personally pay for our flights to boston because we had no money so there's a certain level of shared experience um that we have and it's just you know you handle it differently um and then you know everyone else in the company we, there are some people in the company that have been with us for six years so we have a different communication style with those people than someone we hired six months ago. So there's one person, where is he? So this guy was with the company before we hired him. So like we have a certain camaraderie with the company. The guy doesn't work for us, technically, but anytime he wants to talk about something, he has no problem coming to talk with us directly because he talked with us first and he's not going to change his style. He doesn't report to us. We don't set his raise. Um, but, you know, he knows us just from having been there a long time. Um, I have two more slides, this and one more. So, uh, skills you want to develop, I think I've hit most of these. Um, convince people to work for you just by, by you believing in what you're doing. That's what's most important. If you don't convey that you believe what you're doing is going to work, you have no chance of convincing others. Because when I talk to somebody, if they don't think it's going to work and they're not sure about it, so why should I spend my time on it? They know a whole lot more about it than I do. And if they don't think it's going to work, I don't, I don't want to help. It's not that you might not be wrong. You might be, you might be wrong, your company might fail. But try as hard as you can, and work as hard as you can at it until it doesn't work. And then when it doesn't work, you don't have to sweep it under the carpet. Be honest about it, just, just explain, hey, I tried my hardest, we found a fatal flaw, and we stopped. It's okay, I don't have any problem with that. But try your hardest at it while you're, while you're doing it. Um, this last point around being passionate, that passion is contagious early on. Um, you really want to hustle as much as you can early on and show that that you know you can you can make you can will this to happen if people if people's impression of you is it's going to happen because that person is involved and that person is going to make it work everyone's going to want to get around the table and that's contagious so find a way to make that happen and if you can't convey that enthusiasm get some other people on your team that can convey it you may have that enthusiasm but it just may not you may not have an easy time communicating it for language or for whatever reason but get someone on the team who can be the cheerleader and communicate. And this is the last slide. I'm just going to, and these got poached, uh, I poached these from my partner who we're going to talk about 10 years ago. I'm going to talk about top 10 characteristics across industries that you see in, in startup entrepreneurs. Ooh, good, they're even in the field. So learning, practicing listening, I think we already talked about that really, really briefly. Extremely important. 
surrounding yourself with smart people. Remember, if you want to make these decisions, find people who have made them before. And if you pick stupid people that have made the decisions before, everybody figures, everybody can figure out what kind of advice you're going to get. You're going to get the wrong advice. So make sure the people you surround yourself are intelligent and have made smart decisions. Um, spend your investor's money wisely. Uh, you should spend your investor's money like it's your own money. When your investor visits you, you shouldn't have brand new office chairs. That's not a good way to spend your investor's money. Make believe you're spending it like your own money. And if you're not savvy at spending your own money, get someone on your team who can figure out how to spend it carefully. Whatever you think you should spend, you should always spend less. You should be as frugal as you can. You should be the second, third, and fourth users of everything that you possibly can. It's my favorite model for our shareholders is we love being the second users of things, right? We don't like people coming into our building and seeing new things. That's generally not the type of thing we like to buy. If we have to once in a while buy it new, we buy it new. But we'd like to be the second user. Usually the second user pays like 10%, the first user pays 100%. Um, articulated share of vision I already covered. Uh, make sure you trust in your respect your partners. Uh, one of the points we talked about early on, but that's really important and that doesn't change over time. And you should trust your investors also. You should trust um, all the partners in your company and the people you work with. Ultimately, um, I had one investor tell me this. Uh, he said, life is too short for me to work with people I don't like. I really like that motto. I mean, I hope I can get to the point in my career where I can always enforce it, because there are people I have to work with once in a while that I don't like. But if I can get to the stage in my career where I don't have to work with somebody I don't like, that would be great. But at least maybe use the motto, most of the people I work with, you know, work with only most of the people that you like. Because it's hard to come to work every day if you can't stand the people you're working around. Um, unlimited stamina and passion we already discussed. Don't take yourself too seriously. Know how to have a good time once in a while. Go out with the people you're working with. Um, joke around. Don't be serious all the time. I mean, you need to let off some steam once in a while. Don't worry like, oh, I'm the boss. I can't ever be seen as a normal person. I mean, that's ridiculous. You're a human. Um, whether you're the boss or the founder or whatever role you're playing in the company, just be a normal person and be yourself. Make sure you focus early on. It's uh, very easy. I didn't talk about this it's not really a management uh, building a team concept but early on people try to do like five different things at once it's the easiest mistake you can make continually sit down and try to narrow that to the, your top task and try to spend like 90% of your energy on your most important fo most important task so write down the top five and then force yourself to spend 90% of the time on number one and then when you finish number one move on to the next one but doing too many things at once is tricky um, sense of humor, I think that's pretty obvious, not that complicated. Um, leverage your ego, don't bronze it. And, and what, what, I'm, what is meant here, well, first of all, these aren't my top ten. These are from Robbie Hardy, who's an, who's an uh, entrepreneur, now an investor. She gave this talk about uh, ten years ago. My partner heard it and he really liked it, and I like most of the points here, too. Um, leverage your ego, don't bronze it. That means I have some humility. So even if things go great, or even if you're knocking it out of the park, Defer that credit to other people. So if your company's win, you know, you just won an award for the best, uh, you made the best widget in the world. You get up to accept the award. Don't tell everybody how great you are and how thankful you are that you're brilliant and you won the award. Defer credit to other people who helped you win that award, okay? That's the kind of person that people like to be around and that people like to help. Someone who shares credit with others, not someone who takes credit when usually the person who's taking credit doesn't always deserve it all. Often the person who's sharing credit might deserve more than, than, than they're receiving. So um, I think that's a really important point, trying to be humble, trying to listen. Generally, these are good characteristics of building the team. So we'll just wrap up here. And if you guys have any more questions, I can answer. Uh, just fire away. Any questions? Maybe one or two. So for early on, how, how do you get on scientific advisors, for example, I guess you put them with equity and such, but how do you also draw the line, since they're also in an area that you're interested in, and I'm assuming they have some level of interest, how do you draw the line of signing an NDA, making sure that it doesn't become competitive aspects? Um, it's a good question. Usually, so if, if, you, if your core concept is protected in some fashion through intellectual property, it's a little easier. Um, if it was just like a good idea for a website, it's trickier, obviously, because once you start telling people the idea, it's hard for you to protect it. So let's assume if your idea is protectable, you generally could use a confidentiality agreement. 
uh, at a first pass, I think you want to be able to convey your business without sharing any confidential information. It's too complicated to get someone to sign a confidentiality agreement at a first pass. So find a way to meet with somebody and talk with somebody um, at a high enough level where you don't feel threatened with that confidentiality. Um, does that help answer your question? What was the first part? I'm not sure if I caught the first part. I mean, it was mainly, um, there, I guess there's two parts, right? Working with someone who's in the same industry as you, and the second part would be, since you're a very early startup, you know, how do you get them on your team kind of like that? Or say say you don't even have a patent, you know, how do you get them to, to become a scientific advisor and try to help you through that? Um, so if you have a technology that needs a patent and you don't have it, it's too early to start talking to tons of people. Uh, you know, if you have a, a life science technology, generally it needs to be patented. You probably are going to be a couple of years from the patent getting filed before you're at the stage to build a company. So there's nothing wrong when you have a great concept to incubate it in the university for a couple of years. I mean, that might be the best thing to do for a year or two. Um, I don't know, that's probably the best advice I could give you. You have to be careful before you have a patent in place to, to share too much information. You can actually invalidate your, your confidentiality if you do a poor job sharing information not under confidentiality. That's a risk. All right, let's wrap it up there. Let's thank um, Jonathan.